Hello everyone, welcome to Maud's Book Club. We are doing things at a bit of a different time today. Uh, usually you'll see us on Wednesday evenings, but because we are so global, we've decided to get your Saturdays happening. A big shout out to everyone who's dropped on by. We've got Avery, Seb, B-Rock Vandal, Stargirl. Thank you for the uh, resub, by the way, B-Rock Vandal. Thanks to Chief, first time chatter is in here. Seb, who's in, I believe, Prague. Oh, no. Nice. Norway. Uh, you finally have a good time time zone as well with that one. So a big shout out to everyone who's dropped on by for this different time. I am so excited for this one. Seb's just resubbed for 34 months saying, hello, book club. Welcome, Victoria. Hi, KP Dubs. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> KP Dubs says, I'm at work. Shush, you never saw me. All right, cool. <laughs> Smoke and whistles, everybody. Uh, a plus employee <laughs> right there. Uh, I am joined by the V.E. Schwab. Uh, we get to call her Victoria today. It is so exciting to chat about a plethora of books that uh, we have covered uh, over numerous book clubs, um, one of them being Darker Shade of Magic that we've got right here, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue and The Vicious Series. Um, such different books. And that's what I, I, I did a video on TikTok where, I mean, I've got the number one fan flag out just being like, who is your Insta buy author? So if this author writes anything, you're going to buy it, no questions asked. And you're my number one because of the Aww. versatility that you have. I just think Thank that you. the way that you write and the way that you can sort of create different universes with different characters, usually morally gray, which is everyone's fave um but I guess out of all of those things which of which of the books do you feel like you poured the most of you authentically into it Ooh, I mean well thank you first of all thank you for having me I, I'm a delight to get to chat with you and yes I, I'm known for writing wildly disparate stories but I think it's hard to answer that because the books that I write are time capsules of the time period that I'm writing them so Vicious was written when I was 25 and Vengeful when I was 30. Um, Darker Shade of Magic at 27. Addie LaRue took 10 years. So I think it's one of those things where it, the obvious answer is Addie because it took so many years. But honestly, I pour everything of the age that I am and mm. everything that I'm feeling and everything that I want to convey into the book that I'm writing at that moment. And then when it's done, it becomes this time capsule of who I was at that time. And I can pick up each book and I can see what I was going through, what I was feeling, what I was interested in. So each book in a, in a way becomes a little tombstone. <laughs> That's fantastic because it's like obviously your interests ebb and flow and change um, where you're at creatively is always evolving as well. Um, what was it about sort of 25 where you're just like, we glorify superpowers, but let's put a very realistic lens over what it would be like. Honestly, that Vicious is born out of a very specific time period for me because I was about to quit publishing. Ooh. So Vicious is my fourth novel, my first one for adults. I had been writing YA before that, and it wasn't going well. It just wasn't. Like, I just couldn't get my traction. I had a really toxic relationship with my first publisher. And Vicious came out of two things. One, a, a kind of academic interest in how we choose who we root for. So I basically, from like an, like an academic perspective, wanted to see, can I write a story where... I make you root for bad people. And the, the thesis is that we don't actually judge people based on what they do. We judge them based on why they do it. And that's really the fundamental difference between Victor and Eli is not what they do, but why. And so I was really interested in the exercise of could I make you root for bad people? But Vicious as a novel was just everything I liked mm -hmm. because I figured this was going to be my swan song. This was going to be the book, no, you know, nothing else was selling well enough. I was being told by my publisher that I wasn't trying hard enough. I what? was 25 and I was just miserable. And so I thought, well, if I'm going out, I'm going out on my terms. I'm going to write the book that I want to read. And what that turned out to be was like, the secret history meets X-Men. Like it was like an idea of Victor and Eli are essentially Professor X and Magneto in their college years and like a toxic bromance. And and that's what I wanted to read. I wanted to read and therefore I wanted to write complicated humans making bad choices. And I think we don't really relate to the grandiose. We don't relate to things like world domination, but we've all been slighted by mm -hmm. somebody we've all been hurt by somebody and so I like to take the big ideas and make them very small and personal I thought that that was so well done 
Um, especially, I actually need a confession about this book because you do deal and delve into different psyches, uh, personalities, and also how they get their powers. I thought that was so fascinating. I'm going on so many tangents already. I thought that was so <laughs> fascinating of yeah. like cheating death and your dying thought, your desperation manifests into a power. Where did that come from? Yeah, I mean, I, there's obviously a physical component to a near-death experience, but there's also in my thesis of this, this book is a thesis, a psychological component, uh, a metaphysical component. And so I thought, what an interesting way to generate powers instead of it being arbitrary, a vat of acid and God knows what you get. I thought instead, what if we have the psychic component, the mental component, the thing that actually decides whether or not you're somebody who has that brush with death and returns from it, what if we delve deeper into the state of your mind in those last moments and have the, the last thoughts, the last kind of driving force, the thing that makes you want to survive and the exact nature of it be the thing that shapes your power. So Sydney and Serena Clark both drown, but they have wildly different reactions to that experience. One of them trying to reach for her older sister is thinking, come back. And ends up with this ability to resurrect the dead. Serena reaching for her younger sister is simply thinking, no, I won't allow it. Like my word mm. should be enough. And she comes back with the ability to essentially bend every living person to her whim. So this is the confession that we need to talk about for a okay. while. And I'd like to blame Jedi for this notion. Yes. But the question of what superpower I've spent way too long thinking about it it's a first date question you know it's a real window into someone's soul what superpower and if someone says flight you're like okay no you haven't thought about this at all let me debunk no. that for you and make you feel like a fool um and then i kind of landed on the power of persuasion and oh, i know i know i know okay <laughs> and i've had to justify it because it is almost inherently evil to be able yes. to take someone's will away from them. But then my argument was, then why do Jedi have the ability to do that if it's it's not the Sith? Do you think, okay, I'm not a huge Star Wars person, but I do feel like my, my narrative argument there would be that they are only persuading people of something that deep down they want. So when they're persuading a Star Trooper, a Storm Trooper, oh my God, that's like the <laughs> biggest nerd faux pas right there. When they're persuading a Storm Trooper, um, then maybe deep down those stormtroopers like Finn don't actually want to be doing evil, yep. don't actually want to be following. And so there's some deep part of their, their, their being wants to be good. And so essentially the things that the Jedi do are like steering them back towards good. That's what I because hope I, think, I would yeah. use it like. I hope you would not. Okay. You would not. The entire the entire argument <laughs> behind vicious is that like power makes us worse. And you power know what? Invariably makes us worse. And I think that Serena cured me of wanting that ability yeah. because it yeah. showed me a very honest, transparent, and scary unfiltered yeah. look at what that power can do. So I will say that as a cleansing exercise, you have indirectly made me a better person yeah. thanks to I'm Serena. I'm the only one who has the right power. I'm the only one who has the right answer to this. Like, oh. I know what the right power would be. What is it? I've thought about it a lot. Okay. okay. So the right superpower for anyone who's a lover of creativity or of books or millennials like us, you just feel like there's no time in life. Okay. Hear me out because it's going to sound wrong at first. So the right power is time control, but with a massive caveat, it's only moving forward. So you can't go back because all of the paradoxes that we deal with, all of the like butterfly effects, all of the problems come when we try to rewrite the past uh -huh. and it spirals out of control. No interest in that. I want a pause button. Oh. I want the ability to stop. I want to pause life around me for one month so I can read. I want to pause it for a year so I can write. I just want to like, I want to control time going forward. I want to speed up through terrible moments and slow down through beautiful ones and pause as long as I want to stay still in a moment. But this is in no way manipulating a timeline. It's simply no, sim it's just, simmering within it. It's simmering. It's being able, much more like Dom in Vicious, being able to step out of time. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, poor Dom was just so, he needed a hug. 
He did. He needed he a really went through it. time pause on just being held I, for I a while. I would argue that pretty much everybody in that series <laughs> goes through it. <laughs> Um, I also love that little nugget where you are dealing with characters that start with V and E. Was that a little uh, nod to? <laughs> okay, so here's the problem is remember, I wrote this book just for me. Oh. I wrote it and I knew it would never get published. So I was just writing like it was just to entertain myself. And then it sold. Uh, and I was publishing as Victoria at the time. Um, and then we like got all the way through edits on this book. It's getting ready. And my editor goes, okay, we want to use your initials, like, you know, so we're going to use VE. And I was like, great. And she's like, I never asked you what the E stands for. And I was like, oh, it's Elizabeth. And she, like, there was a very long pause, and she was like, your name is Victoria Elizabeth? It's very regal. And you named your main characters Victor and Eli, just the male versions of your name? And I was like, and she was like, well, shit, it's too late to change any of this now. But it is like just an exercise in narcissism. So yeah, I, I just like did it that way because they were just two halves of my personality. That's so interesting. So you really relate to both Victor and Eli. Victor is much more me. Victor, up until I wrote Henry Strauss in Addie LaRue, oh, Victor yeah. was my first ever autobiographical character. So super villainy aside, like in terms of performative nature and kind of like social mimicry, I'm an introverted only child who definitely leaned into social mimicry hard when I was growing up. And so in a lot of ways, that sense of isolation that Victor feels that makes him this perpetual observer yes. is a thing I felt really intensely. Uh, and also just like sometimes feeling like my emotions are like a two when everyone else's are like a 10, like sometimes feeling like I'm not operating on the right frequency for those around me. So Victor, much more obviously. I relate to, but there's something about the God complex that Eli has that I, I definitely have. Be, I grew up with like a sick parent. And I think when you grow up with a sick parent, it, it can create this like hyper vigilance that can lead to kind of a God complex. Meaning I grew up convinced that if I just tried hard enough, I could keep the people I love alive. Right. And I think that I definitely harbor that God complex still. It works for me in books because I'm literally playing God with my characters i'm making up whole worlds and then i get to control them but i you'll see this god complex character through a lot of my books whether it's somebody obvious like luke in addy or um i have it in goodness i have it in in most of my books i have another one in this savage song uh leo who's very much like eli's kind of flip side character somebody who feels like they've been chosen Hmm. or feels an immense like existential compulsion um so that's the part of Eli that's me not to make this a psych session, I was gonna but... say this is like such an insight and like the writing these characters <laughs> is a way to sort of process yeah. and it's very therapeutic Absolutely. to be able to get through it all Eli's scary <laughs> though Eli's terrifying yeah um I think I mean, my goal was to make Eli the villain in Vicious and then to make you understand him a little bit more in Vengeful because it makes it really a lot harder to hate somebody once you start to understand what makes them tick. And that, I think, is the best villain out there. They never think that they're wrong and we start to wonder, it would make sense. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Eli's having his own existential and, like, a spiritual crisis in Vengeful. But I love a long con character. I, ha I do that with Holland in the Shades of Magic series where, like, the goal is in book one, He's your villain. In book two, he's an antagonist. And in book three, he's a protagonist. And this happens because as the series goes on, you learn more about how he became this person. And we start to like connect with him. Whereas in the first book, you never get any of his flashback. You never get any of his past. And so it's really easy to like deem him the villain. And then as we start to like peel back the how we got here, then you as the reader start being like, oh, no, I kind of like him. Well, we got <laughs> we got the moment in the first book where it's like it wasn't all what it seemed with Holland because yeah. it was a very black and white sort of picture. He's evil. He's trying to take him down. Yeah. And then it was that oh, beautiful <sighs> moment where he's dying and there was a moment of peace yeah. that he was yeah, almost like where willing he just it. Wanted it. Ah, yeah. oh, I'm so glad that he's that important. I'm glad that we're not saying goodbye he to is, him. Yeah, I've got the other two. Very, very much. I was gonna say he's he is uh, he is a essential i would say to the rest of the series you have not seen the last of him at the end of that book i feel like that's almost a great <clears throat> excuse me segue into starting to talk about the darker shade of magic um 
especially when you've got uh, Vicious being a much more contemporary story with supernatural sort of unveilings, whereas this one's more steampunk, uh, more gritty. I kind of got, especially yeah. with uh, Kel's cloak, I got very much sort of like a Doctor Who wibbly wobbly time traveling Ooh, yeah 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 you know all is not what it seems like something that's quite innocent like a phone box or like a coat you know has so many more dimensions that you than you think but what was it like introducing a darker shade of magic uh <laughs> but a different type of magic with the anta uh, antari antari yeah well, so most of my magical systems, and like Vicious is a magical system, it's it's a playing with science. So I guess it often gets shelved in science fiction because it's playing with medical science. But my magical systems, whatever they are, I try to make them really grounded and really natural and nature-based. And so in Vicious, we are dealing with like that threshold between life and death, but also what's been what's been documented in, in our own world in terms of like adrenal responses and how they can give you this kind of temporary state of, of superhuman ability. Uh, all I did was take it one step further to like a permanent state. Uh, in A Darker Shade of Magic, it's really like a love letter to like Avatar The Last Airbender and Yay! Metal Alchemist. Like I wanted to take my magical system and make it really grounded. So it's an elemental grounding uh, everything kind of comes back to these elements that they're able to manipulate. It's just that my Antari magicians, these really rare magicians, can also use blood magic, um, which is just takes them up to the, the nth degree of power. I love it. I love building magical systems because my I wasn't a huge reader growing up. I felt really alienated by a lot of fantasy, specifically, because it felt like it. you almost had to like prove that you were a good enough fan. Right. Uh, I felt like, especially growing up with, like, Lord of the Rings, like, you, you had to, like, learn a fictional language, and you had to, like, prove that you knew everything, and you didn't just read Lord of the Rings, you read the Cimmerillion and all of the other, and, like, you just, it didn't feel like I could ever do enough, I just wanted to read a good story. And so, for a long time, I, like, avoided fantasy, because I felt really alienated by that kind of gatekeeping of who, who gets to call themselves a fan of something. So when I set out to write Shades of Magic, I like specifically was thinking about that version of myself. And so I, instead of writing multiple worlds, it was like one world, four ways, and each mm. one with a philosophical relationship to magic. I like found ways to undermine these fantasy elements that I had felt kind of off-putting. And so um, I wanted, there is language, there is like fictional language, but it's the spice and not the meal. And you don't have to read it. You can skim it if you like, or you can learn it if you like it. They're both valid directions. And I wanted to take everything back to the most accessible place possible. Because for me, I think just as a practical author, um, every step that we ask the reader to take away from reality is a step we lose somebody. Mm. And, you know, I didn't want to take 50 steps. From reality i wanted to make sure one foot was always there in reality and that meant that making my magical systems as intuitive and intrinsic as possible that meant um nothing is arbitrary and we can understand that we can wrap our head around it i never wanted to lose somebody because the system became too complicated for them to me that's an, such a stupid way to lose a reader like by like excluding them by making something feel too inaccessible and so at the end of the day like uh, yes I want to write fantasy or I want to write sci-fi or I want to write some genre I just want it to be fun I want you to forget that you're reading I want you to fall in and I think anything that pulls you out of the narrative because it's asking too much of you mm -hmm. because it's not intuitive and so I think taking things back to like really nature-based systems making sure that like as complicated as things get they start in a really organic way like here's four worlds think of them like four books set side by side here's the source of magic on one end so it doesn't reach all the way you know here's ways to think of it that are very natural and very intuitive and then over the course of the books we can build and we can add magical elements but you'll be able to hold on to them and follow them because you have a really strong foundation mm -hmm. Uh, the comments that are coming in, very appreciative of it. Uh, Black Belt saying, I love the magic system in Shades of Magic. B-Rock Vandal saying, Darker Shades is one of my favorite magic systems. Aww. So I, I do think that it's a real yeah. testament. And you're right. Like when we kind of explored fantasy mm -hmm. when we were younger, it was often written by the same type of man. Yes. You know, and I think that that was like the, they had to one up each other and it became sort of like, you know, too far removed from 
that grounded yeah. thing. But I will say, you There's know, also, oh, it was yeah. white guys that wrote Avatar The Last Airbender I'm, and like, holy no. hell, like that I show. Know, they can do it. Yeah. They can do it. I just also think that like sometimes with fantasy, it's really telling who's writing it because if you design a fantasy that looks exactly, like has the exact same power dynamics that our world already has, what that says is you already see yourself at the center of the story. Mm-hmm. So my, te- my stories tend to be like aggressively more queer they tend to be aggressively less white. They tend to like take characters who are often fringe characters in those traditional white male straight narratives and they take them out of the periphery and they give them center stage because I, I like normalize a lot of things because to me, like that's my fantasy. My fantasy is like you getting to love who you want to love. And of course you have to shift a power dynamic. So instead of the power dynamic being on your identity or your sexual orientation, it's literal power. It's who has more magic. And by shifting it onto who has more magic, we shift it away from other things, like other things of, of race and of class and of um, sexuality. So that those can, because like to me as a, as a reader, I want to read normalcy. Like I, I want to read something that isn't like, I don't want the only reason I get to take up space on the page to be because of one facet of my identity. I yeah. don't want to be a token. And I think that lived experience will absolutely help with that. And I think that the notion of showing and not telling, that's the number one way where it's just like, it's not this, it's just we're living, we're living because this is what life actually is. And it's, you know, such a, it's an everyday slice. So I absolutely appreciate that. Also happy pride month. (laughs) <laughs> oh thank you whole month um but, I know. <laughs> but with that I also really appreciate that instead of getting like, you do have to build such rich worlds and magic systems like that is an integral part mm-hmm. of fantasy but it's also cannot get in the way of character development as well would you say mm-hmm. that um character and sort of plot supersedes the world building side for you no, I mean, they are all in conversation. I think at the end of the day, character's king. And the reason character's king is if you don't care about the people that a story is happening to, you don't care about the story. Yeah. Like, if you look at why we come back to subsequent novels in a series, we don't ever come back for plot. We come back because we miss the people. Yeah. We come back because we want to see more of the people. You don't come back to book five or six or seven because you're like, wow, that plot was really great. You come back because you're like, I miss my friends. I miss these fictional compatriots. I miss their banter. I miss their love. I miss their danger. You can, you also can miss the world. You miss the characters and you miss the world. You don't miss the plot. Plot is obviously essential for telling a good story, but at the end of the day, like I want to build a world you want to spend time in and I want to build characters you want to spend time with. Hmm. So let's talk about the characters in Darker Shade. You've got two Very, very opposite, but so wonderfully beautiful characters in Kel and Lila, Delilah. Um, I sort of love the fact that we've got a a character that sort of goes against what so many women are written like in fantasy. Uh, She's just so wholly herself. She's a survivor. It's like Mm -hmm. suppressing emotions to deal with situations. And I think that the fact that Kel is almost allowing her to to feel and process is a beautiful dynamic but they're very different people and if you when you first look at Kel you think oh he's very you know intelligent and he's do good and then you realize he's smuggling you know like he's he's breaking rules and then you've got Delilah who's a survivor she's looking to um you know she's ambitious she's got these big goals of owning her own ship and being a, 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 a pirate but she's almost a moral compass for Kel at the same time um how <laughs> how was it finding these characters I mean I love them they're two of my favorite characters I've ever written because Kel is so deeply emotional and Lila is so analytical yeah and I also think what's really interesting to me is like uh Lila is probably my favorite character I've ever written Uh, She was deeply aspirational for me when I was writing her. She's definitely a reaction to what I was reading a lot and seeing a lot in fantasy. And what I love about her is the kind of hate that I get for her. I receive so much hate mail for Lila Bard. Hold on. Yeah, so much. And what I love about it is this. The way that I wrote Lila is I wrote her as a classic male (laughs) anti-hero. I literally gave her everything, everything we give to classic male anti-heroes. 
and from the like uh the analytics and the ambition and the aspirations and the cutthroatness and the like you know near do well and you know you know devil may care and then i gave i gave her she her pronouns yeah and the hatred like it is a stone i mean people love her people love her to the moon but i'm always amazed by the people that hate her and that think she should be punished for being the way that she is, for being ambitious, for being cutthroat, for being this this perpetual insider. Because Kel is an outsider in his own world, and Lila's an insider out of her world. She's somebody who can go into Kel's world and essentially make space for herself, and he's somebody who is born feeling deeply uh, at odds with his world. And so it allows him to have the emotional side and her to have the, like, drive the physical cutthroatness and I just love it for her I think that they work in conversation and I think it's really interesting that if I had let her be a man which is kind of her entire argument but if I had let her be a man she'd get away with all of it and we would never blink we would never blink the first time she kills someone on page people are like <gasps> she just killed somebody and I'm like yeah do have been killing everybody like like why is this so special it just showed that she was willing to put herself first. And I think we historically, it's in YA fiction, which is where I came from, and adult fiction where I am now, we historically feel like when women have power, they must be selfless. Mm-hmm. And Lila is a selfish person. She's a self-interested person. In fact, the whole point of the series is, will Lila care about somebody else enough to put them first? And she does for Cal. And it is the first time in her life she's cared about somebody enough to like put them ahead of her interests, which have to be king. I also think it's quite beautiful that she's not swooning over Kel no. in book one. Like in fact, Kel is swooning by book two. Kel is swooning over Lila. Like Kel is going. There's a there's a thing in book two. This is not spoilery, but like they part ways in book one, and in book two you find out that like. Elle has been visiting the night market every week just to see if Lila has come back through to Kala's stall. Like he's just, and he's doing it on the, like the interested in clearing any debts she might have accrued, but he's just trying to see if she's come back to London. Like he just thinks about her. He's well, swooning. There is something so powerful um, with, especially a woman that completely owns who she yeah. is or who they are and uh, is unabashedly themselves. And it's like yeah. that thing where it's like, you know what? Not all my qualities are going to serve you at all. I might not make you feel good about you. I'm going to look out for me, but I'm not going to apologize for that behavior. And they will tell you she's the most fun to write. Because when I put Lila in a scene, I know exactly what she's going to do. Like, I know it every single time. That's like one of the most delightful things is the like Lila no, Lila yes of everything, which is Kel just walks around selling Lila, don't do that. And Lila walks around being like, yeah, I'm gonna. Like, I love it. I love writing her. She's so much fun to write. Uh, we do actually have a question. Uh, some of the members mm. have jotted down questions um, about mm. all the different books. So there's one from Lisa who says, is the Shades of Magic series being made into a movie or a television series? It's being made into a movie. Um, obviously, everything is on hold right now because of the strike. But uh, I actually just wrote the adaptation myself <gasps> okay. uh, and turned it into the studio. So uh, I have to say I'm like, really really excited really proud so uh yeah sony is our studio and um very i just have an amazing team people have been very patient it's been in development for about six years and that's simply because sometimes things take a really long time to get right and uh i was not the first writer on the script and um i came along and i'm very very excited that they finally handed me the keys to that particular house because i felt like i pretty much knew what i wanted to do with it also no one knows this character better than you like no one knows everything better than you and so i um i turned in the my feature script right before the strike happened but so everyone be patient, but yes, I am. I'm. I'm over the moon excited. We'll see, though. I'm also. I'm what I call a popcorn optimist, which is like when I can sit in a movie theater with a bucket of popcorn and watch it. It's happening. Mm-hmm. Until that point, I'm gonna just like hold back. I've been in adaptation space for like 15 years almost now, and I've had things go and I've had things not go, and so uh, I'm just gonna like hold space and hope and continue to do everything in my power, which is turning in a good script. And good revisions but the best thing people can do is support the books because that tells the studio that there's demand have to do. Mm-hmm. is it confronting to know that these characters that have lived in words will be brought to life by a living breathing person 
You know, it's amazing. I um, had my first television show a year, a year and a half ago uh, on Netflix. And one of the coolest experiences of my life was watching characters I made up on a Tuesday, like be brought, like you just like can't predict the amount of essence and energy that gets in kind of inflated into these people that you write. So am I nervous because I know Kel and Lila better than anyone in this world? Of course. But like, I think that's why casting is going to be really exciting. Um, I think it's nerve wracking, but at the same time, like the beautiful thing about actors is like, they add this extra layer of dimension. Um, the danger is of course, they codify something that lives in our imaginations and they give it a specific form and that makes it harder for our imaginations to replace that or supplant that. But I think the coolest thing is that like, that's what actors do. Mm. Actors take something that has only lived in our minds, uh, and then they make it person they make it just like I can't think of any greater honor as a creator than watching something I made up become realized in that level of dimension okay (laughs) that is so exciting though best of luck because I know that strikes are happening SAG's also happening and that's just (laughs) I have like four projects all in like late stage development and I'm just like oh god can them can they just give give everyone the money just give everyone I what know <laughs> they're it's... wasting so much money what was it it was like 11 days into the strike and already that they there was a loss of what they could have just paid so it's it's, it's mind-boggling but yeah um it's very important and I'm glad that it's happening but I am also really hopeful that it that the studios come to their senses because I'd really like to get the ball rolling we got we got good stuff happening here too yeah uh, Vaden has asked a question what inspired Kel's coat of possibilities oh I love that somebody asked that um okay so it's kind of two things it's in one part Howl's Moving Castle <gasps> like I just love Howl from Howl's Moving Castle and Kel is in largely in many ways inspired by Howl specifically like the Miyazaki version I love both the book and the film but the Miyazaki version of Howl's Moving Castle and then um I have a hard time talking about Harry Potter these days because it was so fundamental to me. And obviously as a member of the queer community, it's, it's complicated. Yes. It's kind of ruined, but um, the room of requirement in Harry Potter, this idea of a space within space of a place that has whatever you need. uh, But even sometimes before you know what it is that you need. And so Hal's coat, uh, Kel's coat. See, I just called it Hal. um, (laughs) Over the course of the series, starts manifesting new coats before he knows what he needs. So he'll notice that like a coat will show up that he didn't know a side of the coat that he was, hadn't seen before. And it will happen right before something happens in the story that requires a new disguise. So the coat is almost predicting in that way. And so that is a nod to the room of requirement. If you could bottle that, like, oh, God. Just that intuition. Oh, maybe that's the superpower. Just like a little yeah. nudge into what's that? It's, it's also like Harry Potter's. Was it Felix yeah. Felixa, where it's like the potion yes, of luck? Yes. Where you're like, I think this is the best thing to do. I was actually exactly. go, going back to powers because I know that ever since Serena, yeah. you know, saved me from my <laughs> villain <laughs> era, <laughs> um, yeah. I was thinking about another one. And I loved your power of being just pause, speed up through bad, slow down through good, but just like, yeah. you know, be able to manipulate the, the speed in which we live, not to alter. But yeah. in going with Kel's coat, um, that having the intuition and someone kind of nudging you towards the answer before you get there yourself, I was wondering if you're able to, because... I read an amazing book by Blake Crouch called Dark Matter where it's like – Oh, yeah. I love that book. Oh, I went headfirst into an existential crisis in the best way. Of but it's like every time you make a decision, boom, it will split. Yeah. And I just kind of want to be able to look through that timeline. Oh, my God. I, okay, so I feel – genuinely haunted by the versions of myself that are on those other timelines so that's what i had i had a vision of maud coming through the door and is she going to be like well done maud or is she gonna be like oh honey we tried you know and i just lost it sometimes i make these choices like big life choices and then i'll swear out of the corner of my eye i'll glimpse the version of me that chose the other one and it's like i feel genuinely haunted by the alternate versions of myself 
So the power of being able to kind of like when you're making a key decision, be like, what would it look like if I made that decision? And what would it look like? We see this in like Kate Atkinson's Life After Life or in stories wherein a character starts over from death. Like every time they die, it goes back to the beginning and then they like try a different way. Edge of Tomorrow, the um, Tom Cruise, Mm -hmm. Emily Blunt does that. Where every time they die, they go back and they have to memorize every decision that they made to get to that point so that they can get one step further. I can't think of anything more exhausting. But I um, I think if I could have anything out of Shades of Magic, any single object, it would be that coat. 100%. And there's like things in the pockets too. Like there are items in the pockets. Like I just think that coat is is just the, one of the most... I also just really love outerwear. I think it shows up in a lot of my books. Like, I just love a good coat. I don't even know what it is, but I want that coat. And I think if the movie gets made, my very favorite article from set will be that coat. Having to get that right as well. Oh, that's a that's a uh, costumer's dream, though. Yes, I know. I want it. Um, I once had a mathematician design me an eight-sided coat. They were like, we figured out how to make fabric move so that you could have, like, eight sides. And I was like, I love that somebody took the time to do this. So it's actually possible? You can get up to like six to eight, I think, depending on like how materials hold. It might have only been four. I might just be like exaggerating in my mind because I want it to be eight. But they got past four, I know. And then they were like, we can't get any further because the weight of the fabric becomes too much for the coat to manipulate. You see those magic tricks where the, you know, lovely assistant kind of is wearing one thing and then whoosh, she's got a yes. different thing completely and it's, you know, yes. a play like that. Like RuPaul, RuPaul's Drag Race last oh, week yes. had like a, a transformation runway and then they were, I was like, how did you even do that? I was like, I want to see Kel on that runway. <laughs> I could actually see this like, oh, oh, I'm going to strut. Yeah. I will strut. <laughs> yeah, that's going to, oh, going back to um, the live, die, repeat. Uh, that's how I dream. Really? Yeah, you said it was exhausting. I can confirm. I will die in the dream and then I'll respawn uh-huh. earlier with the information and I have to try it again. And oh that... my God, in the same night? Yeah. That's sounds... the dream. I thought my dreams were exhausting because they become like entire films that don't make any sense afterward. But like, that That's seems worse. a great segue actually into how you write your books. Uh, it's always a oh, fascinating God. question because everyone has a different process. Uh, yes. One of my favorites is um, Naomi Novik who yeah. just goes. It's just Monstrous. A, a, a single flow of no, book. Absolutely not. And I was doing a little research into yours and it's so fascinating. Um, I have it here. You said that you're a cinematic writer. So you'll storyboard, whether it's a graphic novel or a fully fledged novel, but you create a beat sheet with every scene. So that explains why your pacing's phenomenal. I um, I outline. I like the more books I've written, the more rigidly I do this. I truly outline every single beat. And I do it because I'm an anxious person and I need to know that there's enough story, but also like, it's just the way my brain works. I will outline, I mean, Addie LaRue had like 300 outline beats. Um, And what I'll do is I do this like ever expanding, you know, those like things we had when we were young that were like the fortune tellers that would like open up Yes. and they would just open up. I do that basically. So like for every scene, I have like a sentence of like what needs to happen physically in this scene. And that one sentence becomes four sentences and the four sentences become eight sentences and the eight sentence becomes a full scene outline. So like, as I dive into each scene, I'll just start unfolding it into a larger and larger and larger outline until I have essentially like every dialogue, like I'll just have like, and I know what I want the dialogue to do in this moment. I know what I want the outro to be. I know what I like. So it just becomes very, people would think, Like, it can sound like it's taking the joy out of it, but to me, the joy is in the outlining. The joy is in playing, like, choose your own adventure with my world. And then I got to figure out, like, then I get to choose what's the best way. So if I'm, like, choose your own adventure and I give myself four ways that we can get from A to B in this scene, I can then pick my favorite way. And it's just a matter of when you stop unfolding once the story becomes complete. Yeah, and I just know. So I, the other thing about my writing process that's really specific is that I write backwards, meaning I start with the end. Like I start with the entire ending. 
uh, I know exactly what, like, if, if my, if I were to be one of those, like, bad 90s movies that, like, freezes and then fades to black, I know what the freeze frame is. I know exactly where we're leaving everybody, physically and emotionally, and then I rewind the entire story to figure out where we find them. So yours is literally, you're probably wondering how we got here. <laughs> Yeah, like like for Dark and Shade of Magic, I knew the first thing I knew or first thing I figured out was like Lila walking away from Kel. Wow. At the end. And I figure, okay, so that's the version of Lila that we leave. So how do we unmake that Lila so that she's an unfinished version when we meet her? And I start literally rewinding till I understand, okay, so where does Lila need to be when we meet her for her to have a full journey to get to this version of Lila? And then I do the same for all my characters and I do the same for the plot. And I essentially unravel backwards until I have like, because everything I'm doing is working towards that ending. I truly, I'm like evangelistic about the fact that I believe that the ending makes the book because I think that it's the taste left in your mouth at the end of the meal. And similarly, the way that like you need to care about the characters to care about the story. I truly believe if you don't love the ending, you'll downgrade the whole book, even if it was amazing up until the last chapter. Wow. And it really solves a problem that a lot of authors do have where it's like, they've got the whole story and the characters and the plot, but they don't know how to finish it in like a nice succinct way. Yeah. And I also think it's a good exercise. It's not even just about like having a good punctuation mark. It's a, it's an exercise in figuring out like, where are you trying to get your characters and what is the theme and what is the motif? Like, what are you trying to say? Mm. Not in a moralistic way, but like truly like what's the point of the story? You know, is the point that there isn't one, is it an existential journey? Like in Addie, like, uh, okay. So like, where do we leave her? Like where, and like, so you can mold it onto character. You can mold it onto plot. You can do all kinds of things. I think you, really good exercise and I get very nervous when aspiring authors can't answer it uh, yeah like if you don't you don't even have to know the ending but if you can't answer the question like where do we leave because in my mind it's like I want you to believe that the characters keep going I want you to believe that they're real people and that they keep living so the choice isn't how we end them the choice is at what point do you have to leave the party hmm. Instead of having that definite, like, the end scrolling yeah. across the screen. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. It's the point at which you as the reader don't get to follow anymore. So at what point are you being told you have to leave? And leave them hungry as well. Exactly. Um, mentioning Addie, great segue into, into, yeah, I, and I noticed a lot of food I'm analogies such, as I'm well. Such, it's like it's, it's all about ingredients coming together to make the meal. Yeah. You used sort of spice instead of the meat. Yeah. I'm nerd. You do realize that, like, I have a a, a video game tattoo <laughs> and my dog Zelda. Yeah, okay, so we're in good yeah, company. Yeah, yeah. We're in great company. Um, in The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, it sat with you for nearly a decade. You had the idea, and it was inspired by a number of different things, including the inverted Peter Pan, uh, your dealings with dementia, uh, and then including the Faustian bargain. So I kind of want to... Talk about where it all began, even though you love focusing on the end of it all. Yeah. We'll take it back to the beginning um, because this this is a book that you felt like you had the idea always brewing, but it was the one that you had to write before your time was up. Yeah, it was the one I had to write before I died. And yet actually, like I didn't, I sat on it. So it took me about five years to get the whole plot and to like and understand my characters and things. And then at that point, I should have started writing it. <laughs> and I didn't 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 year after year I just found reasons not to start until I realized at about 29 Henry's age that uh I was scared mm. like I was just too scared not even scared of I wasn't that I was scared I couldn't do it it's just that the thing in my mind had grown too big right and too beautiful and then the thing about an idea is that it's all potential and you can't mess it up but you can mess up the idea in putting it down on paper. You, it, you, By nature, it becomes imperfect. And I didn't want that. It meant too much to me. And then I had to have like a really hard conversation with myself around 29 where I was like, okay, you have two choices. Either you write the book and you embrace the fact that it can't be perfect or you don't write, you die without writing it. And like, it was going to be my 20th novel. It's not like, by the time it came out, it was my 20th. Like, it's not like I wasn't writing other books. I had to make the decision whether I could live with the imperfection 
for the abstract perfection, knowing that it would never belong to anyone but me. And so when I was 29, 30, I finally was like, I would rather have an imperfect reality mm. than a perfect idea. And I started writing it. Um, but There's yeah, a lot of parallels rather... there. Like Addie yeah. LaRue, would she rather have an imperfect life that she yeah. got to live fully? But this is the other reason I'm glad I waited, because I think if I had written it at 23, it would have been a very different book. It would have been a weaker book. And instead, I wrote it at 30. And it, it, if you look at the themes in the book, it's very much about the arbitrary threshold of adulthood. Yeah. It is about hitting that time period where you realize you're suddenly supposed to know who you are and what you want and what you're doing. And like that causes an incredible existential dread and the feeling like life is passing you by. At 29 and specifically, I, that is a uniquely 29 experience that we go through. Yeah. It is. And I think it would have been a thinner story if I had re rushed it. And that's the other thing you have to remember is like, you can tell thousands of stories, but for each book that you're writing, you only get to tell that one once. Yeah. And I didn't want to do it wrong. So with that time for it to sort of simmer and you get to a really good place and you had your decade in the making yeah. existential crisis of, you know, who am I? Am I where I'm supposed to be? Um, yeah. You know, you birthed Addie in her entirety. But as you were saying, it was Henry that we kind of related to more. And Henry is almost the 23-year-old version that took that leap and fucked up. Exactly. You know? So what was it like sort of having this beautiful juxtaposition about the girl who was forgotten but was able to live so long and the guy who wanted to mean something but days were numbered? Henry is the hardest character I've ever written in my life. Because uh, I got to the point where I understood Addie and what she wanted, and I knew exactly how to write her, and I got, I knew Luke, and I knew what he wanted, and I knew how to write him, and I knew what Henry's plot was. Like, I knew what his function in the narrative was from a plot standpoint, and he was just like a cardboard cutout of black paper. Mm. I didn't know who he was as a person, and I thought, I'm truly screwed then because this is a tripod. And if one of the legs is not as strong as the other two, it will fall apart. And um, so I made the great mistake that I told myself I would never make. I broke off more than a tiny piece of myself. Normally I break off a very small piece of myself and I give it to each character and I grow something new from them. Instead, I broke off a hefty piece of myself and I gave it to Henry just to have a way to connect with him. And I ended up breaking off too much of myself and I essentially ended up with a mirror. So Henry, I gave him my mental health stuff I gave him my anxiety I gave him my paralysis when it comes to like again that diverse the divergence of cho of choice what mm. happens when you pick one path it means unchoosing another um and so essentially the only way I know how to describe Henry Strauss is that he's who I would have been if I didn't find writing oh wow I found writing at 19 and Henry doesn't so that was I found purpose. I found purpose. I found a grounding force in my like parental downpour of a youth. Uh, I found a grounding purpose. I found a thing which made sense of everything and gave me a reason. And Henry doesn't. So if I didn't find writing when I did, that's all I had to do to write Henry was roll time forward without the salvation of creativity so you essentially got to live that timeline version of you whoa yeah and it's bad it's bad because i know that like i i deal with a lot of like mental health stuff but the thing that like holds me together is writing but if i didn't have that like he's the unmoored version of me right and in a way the glue for him was it ended up becoming addy but it was too yeah. Lay. Uh, I, I know <laughs> that the feedback for Addie LaRue was sort of a lot of people's uh, quandary of having to deal with starting to understand the devil, like, you know, this yeah. the darkness, the one who seduces you into getting what they want from you. But to make Luke so dimensional in that way, I felt a lot of people started questioning. They're like, no, no, I'm supposed to hate. I'm supposed to hate him. <laughs> Right? So why yeah. am I deeply attracted to now? <laughs> it's the, you I know. Mean, yeah, because he's not the devil. I mean, this is the thing is like, he's an old God. So I'm pagan. And one of the things I think is super interesting about 
when you take gods out of like the capital G. It's like monotheism puts a god with w- one god in a capital G means they have to like be infallible and mm. unknowable. And it's just like not interesting. And when you take the gods and you put them in the lowercase g's, you create a pantheon, a multiplicity of gods. You look at the Norse or the Greco Roman, really easy ones that most of us studied at some point in school. Um, they're really messed up. Like, they are so closely a a mirror to the societies that worship them. And what happens is, like, they are the vices as much as the virtues. Like, they are these static incarnations of drama. And so what I realized is I wanted to make my devil, my darkness, I wanted to make Luke one of those. Because essentially he's like a petulant child. He's Luke is your toxic ex-boyfriend. Like, that is the only way to describe Luke is, like, he is selfish and he's like covetous and he's really possessive and he doesn't have a very good definition of love. And like, he is just like, absolutely. You're like, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on this, but like, he's Heck like yeah. your trashy fuck boy. Yeah. Like, he's just definitely like a trashy fuck boy. I dated Luke. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think most of us have at some point dated a Luke and mm. that's the thing is like, there's something intoxicating about those people and they are not good for us. Like, they are not good for us at all. And also, though, what's intoxicating about Luke is that as Abby is becoming less human, Luke is becoming more human. Yes. But also, like... He's he's masquerading, though. He's, like, literally performing domesticity. Like, literally, like, when he sees Abby, he gets to put on this, like, sexy human shell that she's picked out for him. And then they spend time together, and he gets to play at being human, and it becomes seductive to him yeah so i think that's why we start to like you know justify luke's behavior because we're like but he's getting better i can fix it. i can, I can fix change it. him right and you're like, no you can't yeah that dude is like as old as the stars you are not going to fix him but luke believes he's changing too yeah oh that is really well done but it was you know i was one of the people just <laughs> sobbing sobbing after this book like it breaks you in the best way but it is wonderful okay. um you, you you were saying that you get the most hate uh, about lila as a character do you get sort of feedback uh slash abuse about screw you for making me feel feels this way i mean yeah but that's my favorite kind of abuse like okay. i will <laughs> never i will like i will water my garden with that abuse like i feed on like people because that means you cared like is there any greater um compliment that you can pay an author or any artist that you care that strongly i don't think it's ever a negative if you cared yeah i think the worst thing you can ever hear as a creator is meh true it was fine (laughs) yeah like that's not what i'm going for okay i've got a bunch of questions coming in and i know we're running out of time so let's do a little quick fire with these ones that's it so the first thing that comes into your head pow 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 uh lisa says favorite character from any of your books or does it change with each book uh changes all the time (laughs) okay um can you give us uh any news on the threads of power series yeah it comes out this september this first book and you'll see everyone who survived the conjuring of light And then you'll see a bunch of new people as well. Fantastic. Uh, Avery says, what made you decide to canonize Victor Vale being asexual and vengeful? Honestly, uh, I felt like it was, he's always been asexual and I felt like it was not uh, clear enough in Vicious. There was like too much room for questioning. And so it was really important to me that it be just like crystal clear. And so that's why it's canonized and vengeful because I thought it was like subtext and I wanted to make it text. Love it. Uh, Vaden says, I love how varied your books um, are in genre. People have so many facets to them. However, we tend to be reduced to the most prominent part of our work and or personality traits for you. Do you prefer the focus to be on your writing or is there another aspect that you would like to be emphasized? I want it to be on my writing. I mean, I think that I, I'm not an actor, right? I didn't choose for like the judgment to be in anything but the work that I'm doing on the page. Uh, I love seeing what people take from it. It's obviously very different for each person. I, my goal, if I have like one goal is to like make you doubt your reality. That's like <laughs> what I would like readers of my work to do. I love that. That is morally gray as well. Uh, Jay yeah. Bunt Rock says you write for many different aged audiences. How do you approach each type differently? YA versus adult fiction? Honestly, I write to a version of myself. I don't know who anyone else was when they were 12 or 16 or 20. I only know who I was. So that's what I write to. 
Love it. Robin says, are you interested in writing any more City of Ghosts style books? Maybe. I need to plan. Like, I don't write those. I couldn't just, like, tack more books on for the fun of it. The books, like, one through three have an arc to them. And so if I were to write more, it would probably be three more, and I would need to know the arc. Oh, okay. Oof. Yep. Uh, Jake Bunt Rock says, do you still dabble in astrophysics? No. Uh, that's what I originally went to school for. <laughs> Obviously, veered wow. on that path. I'm still very passionate about space um obviously but i'm also glad to leave that to the scientists oh, okay i did there you go that sounds so ambitious <laughs> uh, i think that's all the questions that we had and we wrapped up right on time that is so Amazing. fantastic thank you so much for joining thank me you. and talking about all these books and diving into these characters and blowing my mind several times <laughs> really appreciate that what's the next big thing that we are shining the spotlight on um, well, right now I'm doing a Shades of Magic read-along over on YouTube where I am walking readers through the entire trilogy, uh, giving behind-the-scenes looks on it and giving away the annotated copies of each book as I finish the individual read-alongs. That's amazing. We'll put the link for that one in the Discord. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. So uh, awesome. Very excited about all the things that you've yeah. got in the pipeline as well. Hopefully we can get that yeah. one happening. Um, so but thank you again. I will, um, I will let thank you go. You. All right, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for watching the stream. Appreciate everyone as well. Bye. Oh, and Thomas says, goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, Thomas got shy. (laughs) No. He says, no. Oh, that's so sweet. Hi, Thomas. Take care.